Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, attending today's webinar. My name is Raj Subramanian. I'm a developer evangelist at Testumayo. I'm also going to be the moderator of today's panel discussion with Angie Jones and Sean Knight. They're going to discuss real world use cases of how they use AI in enterprise testing. So before we get started, there's some housekeeping stuff. First of all, I just want to take this moment uh, to ensure everyone silences their devices, other phones, coffee machines, vending machines, or anything which can produce noise this, so that uh, there's no interruption to the flow of the webinar. And then if you mute yourself, that would be great as well. So let me just take 10 seconds here and uh, let you do that. Thank you. So secondly, I, we want this to be an interactive session. So I have my colleagues, Francis and Jennifer, monitoring all these questions on the chat window. So feel free to post your questions there. And in case you were wondering, they are, not, they are real human beings. They are not AI chatbots, just letting you know. And also, remember that you're going to get a recording of the webinar after the session is ended. So you're going to get that. And also a recap blog post summarizing all the discussions which happened during this webinar, along with answers to questions which we may not get time to cover in this one hour period of time. So that's something to keep in mind. With that being said, let's get into today's webinar. This is our panel for today. And I'm going to go ahead and ask each one of them to introduce themselves. So let's start with Angie Jones. Hi, I'm Angie Jones. I am an automation engineer and also a developer advocate at Apple Tools. I specialize in test automation strategies and techniques. I speak at conferences all over. Um, I blog at angiejones.tech. There you can find test automation tutorials and tech articles related to test automation. And most recently, I've started an um, online learning initiative called Test Automation University, which is a, a free space to take courses on uh, all things test automation. I live in uh, San Francisco, California, uh, but most of the time I'm on the road. Thank you, Angie. Next, we have Sean. So my name is Sean. Um, uh, I'm a previous developer, moved into the automation space about six years ago. And I love dabbling in, in all the technologies I can. Um, I'm a automation engineer at Christian uh, Lifeway Christian Resources. Um, when I'm not doing that, um, I enjoy cooking with my family. Um, and like any good parent, you know, I, I play Fortnite with my children, but I do <laughs> like to take a, take a second to, uh, uh, to thank Testum for allowing me to be a part of this webinar. Um, this is my first webinar and, and uh, it, I think we're going to have a great time. And I, I live in the Nashville area. The pleasure is all ours, Sean. Thanks for joining. But that being said, let's get into the agenda for today's webinar. So first, we're going to set some context in terms of what projects Angie and Sean were actually working on, what problems they were seeing in their projects. And then we're going to talk about why they decided to use AI uh, to solve their current problems and what other solution they already considered before making the AI decision. And then we're going to talk about the results of this whole experience and what were the challenges they had to overcome to uh, apply AI in their enterprise testing initiatives? And then finally, we're going, we're going to talk about lessons learned from this whole experience and also uh, get their thoughts on what they're working on next. Are they applying AI? We'll know pretty soon. So before we get into how you use AI in your projects, 
let's set some context for the audience in terms of describing what types of projects you're working on and what problems you are facing. I think having that discussion will help the audience understand uh, your project and what you guys were working on. So let's start with Sean. So on my team, we maintain a number of projects. Um, we leverage across the entire enterprise, but the primary application I support is an, is an EPUB reader. It's similar to Kindle. It targets universities and colleges, uh, allowing students access to textbooks uh, on any device across any browser. Uh, in addition, it has specialized features that give a rich interaction with that content. The tech is a responsive SBA with a React front end, Scala back end, while the automation leverages Java, Selenium, Scala, and various other testing frameworks and tools for both UI and API testing with a fully automated continuous deployment process. Being the lone uh, QA individual on the team, I wanted to reduce the amount of manual intervention required for each build. That involves testing and checking in all the major browsers across OSs and devices. Basically, at the end of the day, everything would be automated except for, except for exploratory testing. There wasn't an issue with the automation finding, locating, or verifying elements on the page. The issue was how does it actually display across those devices in those browsers? Just because I could interact with it in the DOM didn't indicate it actually displays correctly uh, to the end user. Wow, Sean, it seems like uh, you guys were leveraging a lot of frameworks and a lot of tools from both the UI testing and the API testing uh, end. Uh, but one question I had was, uh, did you have any real devices or simulators? Uh, were you using real devices for testing or simulators? Because uh, you talked about cross-browser cross testing. And so I just wanted to, uh, I was just curious and get an idea on that. Uh, it's a combination. Um, we leverage both Sauce Labs and Browser Stack. So the okay. idea is to test on real devices uh, as much as possible. However, you know, it's not that's not always feasible. So due to you know um, you know time and you know resource limitations, um, but that that is the goal. Okay, that makes sense. Cool. Uh, Angie, what is the, your project and uh, what problems were you seeing? Yeah, so I worked at Twitter, which I'm sure everyone has at least heard of. Um, it's a social media and news site, and I think of it as a virtual water cooler where people from all over the world come together to discuss current events. Um, there were a couple of thousand developers there, but only 15 of us who did test automation. So the automation and engineers had to juggle multiple projects and we had to work very efficiently. Um, I worked on the main iOS Twitter app where I built an automation framework from scratch using Apple's XCUI test. And then I also worked on Twitter's ad composer site, which is the interface that uh, brands use to create advertisements that they want to promote on Twitter. So in addition to having to work fast and efficiently, one of the unique challenges I remember facing was trying to automate against such a dynamic product. So imagine testing like the Twitter timeline or the search features of Twitter. The tweets that are shown, they vary every time you refresh the page. So everyone's timeline is different. You really have no idea which tweets you'll see when you open the app. Cool, that sets some context in terms of what you were working on. So as you and your teams begin thinking of ways to solve these problems, right? What are some of the possible solutions you had considered? Did you directly jump into AI or uh, what kind of uh, uh, tools or solutions uh, you were keeping in mind uh, when you're doing this whole uh, research and uh, applying enterprise AI and enterprise testing? So Angie, what about what what are what were your thoughts and what were your possible solutions uh, you considered? Yeah, so 
uh, the the dynamic nature of Twitter, we considered things like uh, mocking the tweets within a staging environment. Um, but this solution, the tweets will always be the same. And so it's, it doesn't make you feel like you're really testing, right? You're testing the same tweet over and over again. And I've been burned before by testing the same data repeatedly, um, not accounting for other possibilities. So I didn't want to go that route. Um, another consideration I had was generating unique tweets from within the test each time it was run. So using like web services to create like a user if I needed to or generate some tweets for a specific user. And I actually went this route initially, but it was a bit of an overhead and it caused me to have to design like this complex test data management strategy. So it wasn't really an optimal solution for me oh okay and and um i was just curious so what was the reason you're trying to mark the tweets because i know you're you're mentioned you mentioned marking was it to check how many tweets fit in a single page or were you trying to check the ui rendering i was just uh just wanted to know yeah, yeah. So the tweets are pretty much the heart and soul of Twitter. I can't test anything without the tweets being present. And the things I was testing for were uh, like, do the tweets appear as they should? Are the promotional tweets displayed properly? Are all of the components of a tweet shown, like the name, the avatar, the embedded images, the likes, the tweet text, the number of tweets, retweets? all of these things. So mocking it really, we thought about mocking it just so that we could have something to assert against because if it was dynamic, then we wouldn't really be able to know what we're looking for, right? So if it's a new right. tweet, every time you open it, like what do you assert against? Exactly, okay, that makes sense. Thanks for explaining that. Um, mm -hmm. Shan, so, uh, what happened in your situation? So for us, um, AI, machine learning, and deep learning concepts um, for test automation, you know, we just really, I really didn't consider it, consider it or even put it on the radar. I was really thinking about leveraging uh, internal tooling or, or or leverage a tool that's already that already exists. Um, but at some point, I remember listening to a podcast that uh, an individual spoke about using machine learning models to compare images, that conversation really spurred my direction and helped kickstart my research into these more advanced possibilities and options. It's, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned image recognition because I think that's a big thing in ML right now. From Google Photos to cameras on phones, all have some sort of AI for image recognition. In fact, uh, I was just reading the other day, um, Apple, Samsung, Qualcomm, and other uh, phone manufacturers, they have started using AI chips on their hardware devices. So what this means is they could process all these images on the device side rather than doing that in the cloud. So yeah, uh, the what, what you listen in that podcast in terms of image recognition, yeah, I think uh, it's a really important thing right now in ML. So, till now, we have described the enterprise projects, the problems, and the possible solutions both of you have considered. Now, let's come to a more interesting part. Why AI? How did you come to a conclusion that AI was a better approach compared to other solutions you had considered? Angie, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so for my testing, I realized that mocking the tweets or even generating them on a the fly was only a means to be able to validate something. Like, in reality, I didn't really care what the tweet said. Um, I didn't care what image was embedded, and I could care less, like, how many likes or retweets that the tweet had. All I really cared about, what I was really testing, was that the tweets were actually displayed and displayed properly. So I needed to make sure 
things like promoted tweets were seamlessly integrated in the flow. I needed to make sure the images that were embedded weren't covering the text of the tweet, for example. Um, I needed to make sure that the tweets weren't overlapping each other, um, that there weren't any other strange or odd errors that my functional test didn't even know how to check. So this is the stuff that mattered, and I realized this. Um, I was able to use Apple Tools A AI visual comparison to test all of these things. So I always thought that visual comparisons, they simply do pixel by pixel diffs. So I didn't think that this would work for us because like I said, Twitter is super dynamic. Um, the page never looks exactly the same. So that was the challenge, but this is where the AI actually came in to help us. So the AI algorithms offered by Apple Tools allowed me to do layout testing, which was perfect for my needs. So it didn't matter like what the tweet was. The real question was, did it contain all that it's supposed to contain, like a bolded name, a username, a, a timestamp, some text, maybe a, a embedded image or a video, you know, uh, like, retweet, comment indicator, these things. So the more I use it, the more powerful I realized that this AI was. So um, we had bugs in Twitter where, uh, especially on the mobile apps where tweets were overlapping each other. And this looked horrible. <laughs> and um, it was basically like unreadable, unusable. And my regular automation wouldn't catch bugs like this, right? So the assertions that I had before, they just made sure that these elements existed in the DOM, which technically they did. But my code wasn't smart enough to be able to catch the tweets that were not displayed properly. And so AI caught this. And the tweets displaying was, uh, the issue is because you were viewing it in different screen sizes when you were using Apple tools as well? The bug, you mean? Yeah, the bugs you were seeing. Right, right. So we have like Twitter, we uh, support the web. We also have like a mobile web interface. Then there's the iOS, then there's the Android. And so there's, you know, and then with both of these phones, various dimensions and things like this. So uh, there's a lot of variety there for how these things should can be displayed. Right. That's cool. So Sean, what about you? Uh, why did you choose uh, AI as a possible solution? You know, like Angie, uh, we opted for Opti Tools as well over tooling that leverages percentages. Uh, for me, I knew within the first couple of days that the AI comparison feature uh, far exceeded the standard mechanisms that I was using in the past. Um, for example, is Element X, you know, enabled um, or visible? or uh, not displayed at all you know those are queries into the dom you know where the tool actually focused on the visual aspects the, the way the user would view them and there's a lot of flexibility uh, in terms of strictness um, for example you can jump from exact mode um, back into you know or to, to layout and then back again um, within the code uh, there's a lot of flexibility there so that was another nice feature in, in this in this case. Nice, that is that is interesting. Uh, looks like both of you were using AI for checking UI related issues. But how about the functionality? Did you complement this AI based testing which you were already doing with other forms of testing? The reason I ask this is uh, a lot of people, yeah, including me, uh, have fallen into the trap of okay, we have this tool, uh, let's keep using it, then we forget about the functional testing uh, aspect because you're so focused on UI. So, um, so how did you guys uh, uh, manage this? Where, where, do you do other functional testing uh, apart from the visual validation, which we we're just explaining? Yeah, the beautiful thing was that the AI didn't take over, so to speak. So, um, I integrated it with my existing automation framework and used it where it made sense to. So there were some assertions that perhaps weren't visual ones, you know, and they made sense mm -hmm. to verify on the back end with an API or a database call. So I was still able 
to do that. And then there were also instances where using like J unit to assert on a quick selenium check that just made more sense. Um, and I love that I was still able to do that. Um, I like keeping this power and being able to mix in the AI with my t traditional test automation that I was already familiar with. That seems like a really good approach. Thanks for sharing. So I wanted to take a pause here and do a quick poll to get the audience feedback on some questions. So let's start with our first question. Uh, take 30 seconds, and then we can discuss the result of the questions. So I'm going to open a poll right now, and you're going to see some questions, uh, uh, one question on the screen with multiple options, so you can pick one. Uh, I'll give you about 30 seconds. So I'm going to uh, launch the poll right now. You should see the poll. Cool, I'm gonna close it right now and we can look at the results. Wow, so looks like, that. so the question was what percentage of the tests were automated? 50% of the people fell under one to 30% uh, category. And then, wow, there were 32% of the people between 61 to 90, yeah. Man, I hope I work for those companies. <laughs> it's just awesome that they're they're thirty percent at least uh, about sixty to ninety percent automated. So, for me personally, I don't think I'm surprised by these results here because uh, uh, the reason I see that only fifty percent uh, that fifty percent of between the one to thirty uh, ballpark is because I think they have some challenges in terms of skill set where. Uh, getting skill automation testers is time consuming and expensive. And then they're also trying to pick which tools they want to use, what frameworks they want to use. And then what happens is once they start building their tests from 10 tests to say 500 tests, right? Then now they start talking about infrastructure and scale, right? How to handle parallel testing, parallel processing, and those kind of initiatives as well. I think uh, because of these challenges, at least half of them are in one to 30% range. Um, so it wasn't surprising to me. Uh, what about you, Angie or Shan? Do you, do you have any thoughts on this poll? I'm, I'm not surprised by these numbers. I think those are pretty typical. Um, I think, you know, what I've seen in the past, those are, I think we're starting to increase that, but I think you know, those numbers are still, uh, you know, in the same range they have been for the last several years, but they're, they're starting to creep up. There's a, a bit of a trend. Right, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to see uh, that bottom 61 and 90% at 32%. Uh, I, I can't remember the last place I worked at where, <laughs> where we accomplished so much. That's really good. <laughs> that's, that's, what I, that's what Angie was saying, that I should probably, or we should probably work in those companies. Yeah. They have all these amazing automated tests uh, integrated with their CICD pipeline, and then they're working seamlessly. But that's great for people who have that percentage. So thanks uh, again, everyone, for uh, uh, participating in this poll. So let's continue with our the upcoming slides so till now we have discussed different problems ai could potentially solve in testing but just let's take a step back and discuss how to get started using ai in testing i'm pretty sure uh angie and shan like you guys just did not jump directly into the ai space right just because the word sounded cool because they use ai ml deep learning right fancy words <laughs> so shan uh how how wh what did you do to get started um for me i mean i would recommend getting a good understanding of the you know the common terminology you know at least be able to speak the language at a high level 
and and know the differences between AI and machine learning and deep learning. You know, you don't have to get deep, but you know, know a little more than the buzzwords. Um, seek out uh, the leaders in the space. Um, for example, Tariq King, uh, Jason Arbon, uh, Jonathan Lips. Um, mm -hmm. They are trailblazers in the testing AI, AI field right now. Um, and there's several websites and blogs that you can go reference. Um, but for me, uh, you know, I did that as well. But the other thing I did was I got deep into the Appian Tools documentation um, all the way into the source code. I'm a bit of a control freak. So I want to <laughs> understand, you know, everything that's going on underneath the covers. So just so that I have that understanding. Um, then what I did was just start creating demo projects for, for web and mobile um, projects and to just demonstrate the tool. You know, it's easier to get your coworkers um, and your managers and your company on board when they have something to see and something they can experience and, and watch the tool in action. Exactly. That, that seems like a really good approach, Sean. Instead of getting too deep into any of these concepts, you try first to get a high level overview of them. I think that's a really good approach and this helps not to get overwhelmed with all these terminologies and definitely prevents panic attacks <laughs> for sure. And also, Sean, you mentioned Tariq King and Jason Arbin. So uh, yeah, guys, definitely check them out. Uh, they have an organization called AIST.org. Um, they just want to uh, spread the AI knowledge uh, on testing with the community. So definitely check them out. But coming back to the question, so Angie, so how did you get started uh, using AI in testing? Yeah, I, I wasn't as studious as Sean was. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, there's a lot of companies they're claiming to use AI, and um, you know they're using the buzzwords, and almost think like that's enough to get people to just buy into it. I think I'm like many other testers. I'm not particularly moved by that. Um, all I, I really just care about doing my job as efficiently as possible. Um, so I saw a product that solved the problem that I had. And so I used it. Like I didn't care that it was AI driven. Um, that just wasn't really a factor for me. But once mm -hmm. I began using it, I realized just how powerful AI can be for testing. And I think the key for me getting started was just having an open mind and not writing off a tool or a product because of the buzzword stigma, um, but instead just looking past the jargon to see what problem can this solve. That's a that's a great point, Angie, because I, even I get this question at conferences and when I meet people all the time where they say, hey, uh, there are all these vendors using these AI buzzwords and they promise them a lot of things. And then what ends up happening is people buy these vendor tools or say any other open source tool they're using and then figure out that's not what they were exactly looking for, right? So that's why my uh, idea and suggestion to people would be the key thing to note would be first, identify what problem you're trying to solve, right? And then you can pick different solutions um, that could help to solve the problem. Then do a proof of concept to see what works and what doesn't. And then finally you make a decision to buy that vendor product or use that particular open source tool or framework, right? So it, just like how Sean was uh, super uh, focused and detailed in his research on what he exactly needs and fits his project. So I believe that's a good approach for everyone to follow and uh, and do not get you know sucked into this whole AI buzzword thing as well. So you can make the choice and you have the power to do that. Um, yeah, I was reading this book the other day, uh, The Lean Startup. Yeah, I know probably a lot of people would have read that. They talk about the concept of, concept of validated learning, which is build, measure, and learn, right? <laughs> I, I think this concept not only applies to startup companies, but also to testing as well, and also for choosing tools and frameworks as well. So great point, Angie. So I'm going to take another pause here. Um, I have another poll for the audience. So please take about, say, 30 seconds to answer them, and then uh, we can discuss the results. So I'm going to launch the poll right now.
and you should see the poll and yeah let's uh take about 30 seconds and then we'll see what the results were Cool. I think I'll close it for now and we'll discuss the results. Let's see here. So the question was, based on what we just discussed, do you think AI could benefit you to solve similar kind of problems in your company? 44% said not sure. And uh, about, yeah, I have to do the math right now uh, in a live event, but the point is 46. So yeah, more than half of them uh, agree that AI could actually benefit them in some shape or form. So Angie and Sean, I don't know what you guys did, but apparently I think you <laughs> somehow got to the audience and then um, through your use cases, uh, which you just mentioned, I think now people got the point in terms of how they could apply AI in their enterprise testing as well. So um, these were, this was really good feedback and at least we know that uh, what we are discussing is useful. So thanks audience for uh, giving your answers. I'm, I'm just going to close this and keep proceeding. Cool. So I want to come to the next segment of our webinar, which I feel is really important. What were the results of this whole effort, right? Because we talked about, yeah, you say it this way, that way, but people also really want to know what were the results and what is the impact uh, for a project. So now that you decided to apply AI to your testing, so what results did you start to see? Like, how did it eventually solve your problem? Did you see any improvements in test coverage or test process? Angie, so what did uh, uh, what results did you see? Yeah, well, it was surprisingly simple to integrate the AI into my existing frameworks, I thought it was going to be difficult, but it wasn't at all. So I probably spent more time deciding how I wanted to use the AI. I needed to go through my framework and I deleted a lot of the test data generation that I had. Um, and now I was able to test with real tweets, not these uh, mocked or generated ones. And this was way more diverse than anything I had had generated or that I could have mocked, right? So this was really, really good um, for my test and it really enriched it. Um, there were a few cases where my test would fail with the AI and it was great to see exactly why. So this forced me to explore Apple tools a bit more to see how to solve some of these unique problems. And that's how I learned how flexible the tool was. Um, like Sean mentioned earlier, I was able to switch between the different modes and add masks to certain areas of the app like that I wanted ignored, you know, such as like timestamps and, and things like this. Um, and it was really amazing to witness how much more powerful my test became. I ended up deleting a bunch of the code that I no longer needed, such as a lot of the page object code and the many, many assertions that I had to write before to be able to really verify what I was looking for. Um, so much of that was already covered with this simple like one line visual check. And I love that it worked in both my iOS project as well as my web project. So my teams were really impressed. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Seems like uh, uh, at least uh, it saved some of your time based on what you were just mentioning. So that yeah, cool. I didn't have a lot of time like juggling multiple teams, had to be as efficient as possible. So it was really a lifesaver. Nice. So, Shan, uh, did you have similar kind of results or what did you observe from this experience? You know, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on my team, um, they really enjoy, they really embraced and they liked the tool. Um, 
because one of the things was when, when, when something went wrong, you know, there was that vi visual comparison for them to review and understand um, the why it failed versus that old process that I would use of, you know, you interpret those test reports and you go through log files and uh, you're viewing tests at browser stack and sauce labs. And then you create a, you create a JIRA ticket uh, with all that information and you're overwhelmed that developer with so much information <laughs> or sometimes it wasn't even enough information. It didn't even describe the real issue. Um, so for, for me, one of the biggest things was, you know, it brought some balance to reporting. It made it easier for everyone to understand this is why it failed. Um, it wasn't, you know, a, a stack trace that was thrown out and someone had to interpret because we don't allow our, well, obviously our developers aren't going to go through stack traces. You know, we have to interpret that for them. So that eliminated that piece of it um, for, the, for the most part. Um, again, um, maybe, you know, like that, it's kind of like that old saying, you know, the picture's worth a thousand words in this case. <laughs> I totally agree with you, Sean. Now, the reason why I was uh, smiling here and you cannot see me here because we're not in video is uh, I've been in the situation where I posted a bug, right? And then uh, I don't give enough information. Then the developer says, hey, where are the log files? Then he provides the log files. Then he says, where are the screenshots, right? But you were able to do everything uh, and add everything, uh, all the information for the developer to easily fix the issue. So that is really cool. Uh, I totally agree also that, uh, yeah, getting as much information as possible about your test definitely helps people and definitely helps uh, people to fix bugs much faster. So thanks for sharing that. Sure. So now we talk about the results. Uh, let's talk about the challenges. So what are the challenges in applying AI uh, to your software delivery process? Were there any cultural issues or technical issues? The reason I ask this is I've worked in really big companies and they have really strict, tight, stringent processes. Even to do a small change, you had to fill up this whole order form request. It goes through like seven people to approve it. And by the time, uh, they approve it already. The next framework is there and it's already been six months, right? So I've been there, done that. So I was just wondering whether you had any resistance or change when you were trying to do this whole initiative in your respective companies. So Sean, why, uh, did, what were your experience with this? You know, from my perspective, I didn't have a huge amount of disruption. You know, my team and my management were extremely supportive and actually extremely excited uh, about going down this path. Um, and I, and I feel pretty lucky in this case, um, not to having to deal with a rigorous process. Um, I've been I've been at other companies where just getting some third party tooling, you know, uh, can be difficult. And so I can relate to that frustration. Um, I did have to level set um, the expectation of the tool. You know, uh, every tool in our industry will flake out at some point. You know, there are no silver bullets in automation. Right. Um, there's times, you know, the tool is going to flag something, you know, in the image that you would have had it, it where you thought it would have passed. And it, maybe it's a new browser version. Uh, maybe some latency got introduced somewhere and it's going to happen. But, you know, the other thing is to put trust in the tool. You still got to trust it, you know. It doesn't do any good to, you know, put all that effort into um, getting to this point and then not trust the tool. So that, that that's probably the, the the toughest thing that we had to deal with. So, so the two key points you touched upon, Sean, which I also truly believed in was one was trusting the tool or the framework you're using and setting realistic expectations as well, because uh, uh, whenever someone chooses this automation tool or framework, then they think it's going to solve all their problems. And then they uh, say, oh, no, this does not work. That does not work, right? So setting that expectation and trusting the process and the tool definitely really helps in my experience as well. So Angie, what about you? Fortunately, Twitter, they weren't scared to try something new. Um, and everyone knew that I was stretched really thin. So anything that I thought would make my job 
better was a win for all of us. Um, and the good thing was that this tool was uh, free to use if you're doing a small number of checks. So I was able to use it, try it out with any strings attached. And once we all saw how much easier it made the automation process, um, we knew that we wanted to use it on a larger scale and across more of the teams within the company. It's, it's great that uh, both Sean and Andy both of you, looks like your companies were uh, pretty supportive uh, of the tool and the new initiatives. And in my experience, when I actually, uh, when I worked in these larger companies where change is much harder, yeah, as I was saying, I do uh, proof of concepts where uh, I would tell people I'm doing something, what I would do is probably do a proof of concept and see how it works. And then I would say, hey, look at what value you can get. Right. And then slowly <laughs> start engaging interest. Right. You slowly spread like a virus. Right. And then all of a sudden everyone is on board. But at least that actually helped uh, my case as well. So, yeah, thanks for sharing that. So what were the lessons learned uh, from this whole experience? What were like some of the things that came up you, th you think that would be good to share here uh, with our audience? Are, why do you think you would do differently the next time? Um, I, I'll go first. Um, first, it can become really easy to want to validate everything along the way. Um, and having too many validations in a single task actually creates issues. Um, it leads to a more flaky type of test. Um, it goes down the same reasons why we don't have numerous uh, assertions in a single test. Um, I had to actually remind myself to create small atomic autonomous tests. Um, that principle, you know, doesn't go away with visual testing. Mm -hmm. One thing, one thing I wish I would have started out from the very beginning um, would create every test with the least amount of strictness, unless there were the, unless there was a clear and valid reason to switch to something more rigorous. Um, it would have saved time and frustration and resources. The majority of my tests uh, based on if when they were based on layout provided ample amount of coverage uh, without impacting the usability of the application i just didn't pick up on it until about halfway through the code one of the best unplanned uh, outcomes was the mindset change or in a loose definition a paradigm shift where i really started thinking in terms of visual first base testing meaning i no longer queried the dom for visual aspects of within assertions it was less about does the feature just work but more about how does that feature display and lay out within the browser or the device as it's being interacted with less attention to the data being returned or displayed because that's a focus for api testing mm -hmm. um personally i i thought i was focusing more on the problem i was trying to solve versus writing a ton of code for an assertion which lends itself to faster test writing. Um, because again, there's no no queries into the DOM, you know, there's less code and less maintenance. For example, within my page objects, they just became cleaner. Um, whole sections of code was removed because this wasn't necessary. I really love one of the things you mentioned, Sean. You mentioned the visual first base testing. That's a totally uh, total paradigm uh, shift for testers, right? Like in terms of how uh, they're usually used to by the testing applications, at least based on my experience. Another cool thing I just wanted to add to what you were saying, Sean, was you mentioned visual first base testing. Another cool thing happening is uh, UI based test driven development. I don't know how many people have heard about this. The concept is basically you get these mockups, right? And the developers use these mockups uh, to develop a feature. What could potentially happen is because of the use of AI, we can make the AI uh, go through the images and the mockups and then create tests for us while in parallel, the developer is actually writing code. And then what's going to happen is once the feature is complete, the AI by that time would have already finished creating those tests based on the mockups, right? Based on the image recognition, which we kind of talked about uh, initially. and then you can literally just run these AI-based 
created tests on the new feature and see whether it passes or fails, right? And I know a lot of people have been also working on this concept, and that would be a total paradigm shift as well for testers. So something uh, to be aware of, and I found personally uh, interesting. So Angie, in terms of lessons learned, what was your experience? Yeah, I totally agree with Sean. Too much of anything is not good. And when we first hear of AI and testing, we assume that it does everything for us, or at least I assume that. And that's just so not the case. So we are still the brains and the mastermind behind the strategy and the design of our testing and our automation. It's still up to us to use AI where it's most appropriate. So I learned that just because I can use the AI in a certain case doesn't mean that I should. And some of the assertions, like I said earlier, were simply better done at a lower level like the API. So I learned to use AI where needed and also to take advantage of the flexibility that this tool provides. That's great. So we covered how AI helped to solve various problems in your projects, right? That's what we've been discussing. I wanted to ask, what are some of the areas in testing AI cannot be used uh, based on your experience? Because uh, uh, touching on that point would help the audience understand uh, when to use AI and when not to use AI. Sean, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I, I don't think uh, exploratory testing or accessibility, accessibility testing are good candidates for AI. Um, those activities require a human touch, the, you know, the human eye, the human brain, that human feeling. Um, I'm kind of referring to that gut feeling we all have um, from time to time. Um, I just don't think the current technology uh, lends itself to, to that uh, sort of testing. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm great. You know, man, I'm, I'm all about being open-minded, but we need to make sure that we do some upfront homework to determine if AI and machine learning actually makes sense to, and solves the real problem that, that we're trying to, you know, trying to do. Um, and it's not this cool wow factor that we want to implement. Um, exercise some caution um, before committing yourself and your team and your company down a path that might be extremely difficult to back away from. That's a great point because I feel people often underestimate uh, the human aspect of uh, testing. This is true for uh, automation tools and AI as well, right? I feel human mind can never be replaced. Um, in my experience, this is how I see things. I view AI as something complementary to the already, uh, ex the already existing exploratory tests which I've been doing, right? I can use AI to help automate mundane activities, discover new relationships and patterns and get more information of the product. While in parallel, I can do some exploratory testing and use my creativity to explore the application. And, and funny thing is a lot of people do not realize even for training AI models, you need human intervention because uh, you have to make sure you give the right data sets. Uh, for example, say, uh, you're training a model to uh, recognize the images, uh, recognize buttons. You cannot give a data set uh, of all buttons which are rectangular in shape, right? Then if you give a circular button, then the AI is not going to recognize it. And for that, we need the human intervention, right? And also, you, have to con you need humans to constantly keep monitoring the learning of these AI models as well. So I firmly believe in the human aspect of testing and thanks, Sean, for touching upon that point as well. So Angie, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I totally agree with that. It's, it's so true. Um, when we think about test automation, it's usually always focused on regression testing, not testing something for the very first time ever using you know, automation. So AI is wonderful for that aspect. We've already tested something as a human being we're happy with it. Now we don't want to do that over and over again. So give that to the bots to do, right? So this okay. is a really good case where AI is helpful. I wouldn't use this as, you know, uh, my first attempt at testing something. The other thing I know about like machine learning is that it's prediction based. Um, it's not giving you exact 
trueness, right? So I saw this exemplified in a way um, that aptitudes handle failures. So it doesn't deterministically fail the test. Um, And at first I thought that was kind of weird. Like if it failed, you know, fail it. But what it does is it alerts me, the human, that, hey, something has changed here. And it provides me with the information needed for me, again, the human, to determine if this is indeed a failure. So that's how I see AI helping testers in general. Do the grunt work, find the things that would be difficult for me to find as a human, and then tell me what you find. From there, I can do my job. I can take it the rest of the way. Totally. Yeah, totally agree with that. So, yeah, coming to our last piece uh, of the webinar, which I wanted to ask was, now that you've solved the problem with AI, right, the problems you had, what's the next problem you're trying to solve? Just curious, do you plan to use uh, AI to solve uh, the new problems as well? Or uh, do you have, are, are you working on something already with AI, apart from what you just, uh, you guys just mentioned, uh, during our discussion. So, Shan, what about you? Um, for me, uh, I consider, you know, AI, machine learning, deep learning concepts, you know, like first-class citizens now um, to tackle a new problem. Um, they're not an afterthought. Um, you know, I want to bring them to the forefront, but I still want to be extremely cautious when I want to implement them. So there's still, you know, Yes, we want to think about them, but we don't want to just go AI only. You know, there's AI everything because we know that's that's not going to work either. Um, something that I'm kind of working on now is uh, I can share some of it uh, is is creating some test case data for API testing using machine learning. I have a bit of a demo working, um, but it's still much a work in progress. Um, I can't share too much of it right now, but but going back to the question, you know, it's really, you know, I just make it part of the conversation, but it's not always the solution. So th- that's great, Sean. Don't worry to yeah to share your uh, upcoming AI work. Once you're done, we'll, we'll get you in another webinar. <laughs> and then you can discuss about that. Um, but Angie, what about you? Yeah, that sounds really dope, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear more about that once once you got that figured out. Um, yeah, I'm exploring other usages of AI and testing as well. So I love what Testum is doing with AI and like helping with locator strategies. That's a huge problem for automation engineers. I love what Test.AI is doing with uh, finding patterns amongst like all of these apps and providing like out of the box automated tests for those. So okay, those things that we typically always do, like these are the standard tests, those can just already be done and we can use um, our talents to come up with like more interesting and um, I guess like curated uh, automated tests for for our project. So I think it's a really exciting time to be in testing uh, Lisa Crispin. She's watching. I see her out there tweeting right now. Yeah, she... Uh, <laughs> She actually did a blog post recently where uh, she she got input from the community to say, how can AI help you better in your testing? And there's a lot of great ideas out there. So um, I'm really, really, really excited to see like some of the new usages of AI to help us do a better job. That's great, Angie. And, and uh, I'll also make sure... Um, we provide all the links for the resources you're mentioning. Yeah, I read Lisa's uh, blog post as well, so it was really good. So d- definitely something to check out. So before we open it up to questions, I just wanted to take this time to thank Angie and Sean for sharing their experiences with AI and testing. I thought all of these real world use cases uh, you guys were discussing were super valuable. I also like to thank the thousands of people who signed up for this webinar, especially the hundreds who took time out of their busy days to attend this live event. I can remember we're going to send the webinar recording after the session. And also, uh, I'll be writing up a summary 
recap uh, in a blog post uh, about the discussion which happened in this webinar. Uh, and everyone who signed up will get that as well. So before we open up to questions, I know we have five minutes. So a quick um, poll just for 20 seconds would be just to get feedback about this webinar, because based on your feedback, we try to get more topics, we get try to get more speakers in, uh, and it really, really helps. So I'm just quickly going to open the last poll, and then we'll open it up to questions, and we can go over it one by one. So you should see the poll right now. Cool. Thank you so much for uh, filling that up. So right now we can get into the questions because I know we have another three, four minutes at least. So, so uh, Angie and Shan, so I'm going to uh, ask you guys questions from the chat and yeah, you guys can uh, answer them uh, based on your experience. So the first question was, can AI testing tools be used for complete functional test automation? Can they replace tools like Selenium, et cetera? What do you guys think about that? So I wouldn't say like AI itself, but there are tools that are like alternatives to Selenium. Uh, I believe Testum is one of those tools that utilizes AI. Again, they're doing what we're doing as automation engineers, utilizing AI where it makes sense within their product, and then you know they code the rest of the stuff, you know. Um, and so that's a AI AI based tool that I think, um, yeah, it's a it's a viable alternative to uh, do test automation with, you know. Um, I wouldn't say like AI itself in and of itself replaces like test automation. Uh, you know, still need the, the human involved there somewhere. Okay. Yeah, I agree. So, uh, so go ahead, Sean. Oh, no, sorry. Um, just real quick. Uh, and, and I agree as well. Uh, I don't think it's a replacement. I think it's an add to your uh, tool into your tool belt. Um, it's just something else that you can pull out when you need to do some automation. It's not a, I don't think it's one versus the other. I think it's just, a, 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 again, another tool that you have uh, that you can leverage. Cool. Um, we had another question. Can AI-based automation be used to validate the results, for example, making a REST API call? So that was the question. So I, I believe the question was uh, more about, can AI be used to do uh, validate the results of API calls pretty much? I'll, I'll take this one because that's something I'm actually working on. Um, I, I, I'm going to say yes here, but mm -hmm. again, you have to be very careful when you say yes here as well, because there's a lot of moving pieces to making that work. Um, and that's the hard part, um, you know, trying to get the data correct um, is probably the most difficult piece when it comes to trying to do this. Because when you train your model, you can train your model with, with bias in mind. And mm -hmm. if you're not careful, uh, it's going to lean one way or another. And if you're trying to do multiple um, predictions, it's going to, you know, it's probably going to get it wrong. So, yes, can it be done? I believe so. And, that, and that's, like I said, something I'm working on. But it, at the same time, it is still extremely difficult because everyone's automation is different. Mm -hmm. And so it's not going to be a cookie cutter situation. It's going to be a case by case, almost down to API uh, or endpoint to endpoint case. To be honest, um, you're going to okay. create, you're not going to create one model. You're going to create multiple models. And uh, just for the purpose of time, since we have about only a minute or two left, I just wanted to just ask one more question and then, I can remember 
for uh, other unanswered questions, uh, we'll get the answer from the panel members and it will be added to the blog post as well. So one final question would be, uh, where exactly uh, AI can be used in the testing process, test design or test implementation or execution or validation of test results? So where does AI actually fit in the, these processes? I think all of the above. So um, I've seen cases where people are talking about using AI to um, basically help them determine which tests they should even go after, like which areas of the application um, need the most testing. Um, I've heard of AI being used to help generate test cases. Um, like I talked about with test.ai, Sean talked about how he's going to use AI to generate test data um, mm -hmm. that's meaningful. Um, we talked a lot today about using it in the execution uh, phase. And then also it's really helpful in um, the deterministic phase. So looking at the results, looking at log files and things like this and being able to provide like some meaningful uh, result based on that. Cool. So thanks a lot for that, Angie and Sean. Yeah, I know we're one minute past the actual time. So thanks everyone for attending today's session. Um, we are hoping to have uh, webinars like this in the future and uh, your feedback helps us to give uh, better content and have awesome speakers like Angie and Sean as well. So uh, look forward for an email with all the links and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you, Sean and Angie. Uh, we'll catch you guys later. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank Our you. pleasure. Thank you.